There's a famous story, anecdotal story, about Alexander the Great uh, talking to one of his retiring generals. Now, uh, I don't know if it's true. I read it on the internet, so I feel like it has to be true, but, but here's how the story goes. Um, one of, of Alexander's generals um, was older and was about to retire, and he approached Alexander, who was pretty young, and said, hey, I've served you now for your entire career, and I've never asked for anything personal from you. I want to ask if you would pay for my, my daughter's wedding. Um, Alexander reflected for a moment, said, you've been a faithful general. Of course, I'll pay for your daughter's wedding. Go talk to my treasurer and he'll, he'll handle everything for you. Um, the treasurer comes back to Alexander the next day and says, um, you need to discipline this general. And Alexander said, why? He said, because he asked for an exorbitant amount of money. It's going to be the largest wedding that Greece has ever seen. I think he's invited everybody. He's gotten all the finest, um, the finest uh, things to, to throw this wedding. He's taking advantage of your generosity. And the story goes that Alexander thought for a moment and said, nope, give him everything he's asking for. Here's why. Because my general is paying me two compliments. Compliment number one is that he thinks that I'm wealthy enough to afford this. And number two, he thinks I'm generous enough to actually give it. Um, when we pray bold prayers, we are, we are honoring God because we are taking a dare on his ability to save and his willingness to save. Uh, you know, a lot of times we feel like we're presuming upon God when we, we pray bold things. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, so go. And part of going is asking, um, going places and saying, God, do great things here. I believe that you're compassionate enough. I believe that you are, are, are powerful enough that you, that, that you actually will do this. One of my favorite stories in the Bible in Jesus' life about this bold kind of prayer is the story of the Syrophoenician woman who comes up to Jesus because her daughter needs a miracle. Uh, her daughter, I think, had a demon. And so she says, Jesus, heal my daughter. And Jesus' response might be the rudest statement in the Bible. He says, woman, it's not right for me to take the bread that was intended for children, give it to, to the dogs. Um, now, he just called her a dog. And uh, the woman, instead of being offended by that, she realizes Jesus is not making a racial slur, that he's made a statement about her worthiness. He's, he's testing her. And she says, yes, yes, sir. But in a rich man's house, even the little dogs get to eat what, what falls off of the master's table. And what she meant was, yes, when it comes to worthiness to ask for this miracle, I'm a dog. But I believe that your table is so full of grace and you have so much power that it's stuff just falls off of it. There's so much of it, and there's enough even for a little dog like me. And Jesus turned to her and just praised her and her faith and said, you will receive what you have asked because you took a dare, because you believe, you prayed boldly according to my generosity and my power. You can never go wrong hoping too much, believing too much in God's willingness to save. In fact, one of the saddest verses from the life of Jesus to me is Matthew 13, 58, where, where Matthew says, many mighty works Jesus did not in the city of Nazareth because of their unbelief. You think about Nazareth, that's where he grew up. That's where he would have had the most natural relationships. He would have loved to have done a lot of miracles there, I think. Right? It doesn't say that he didn't do them because he didn't care about those people or because he sovereignly had not determined it, but because of their unbelief, their unwillingness. Now, again, I'm not taking away from the sovereignty of God. I'm just saying that I don't want that verse to ever be said about my community. I don't want that verse to ever be said about my family, that there were so many things Jesus wanted to do. He was there in Nazareth. He loved these people. He wanted to show miracles, but their unbelief prohibited him working. I don't want that to be true of, of where I'm pastoring and I know you don't want it to be true of, of, of where you're pastoring. And that means we pray bold prayers, taking audacious risk on the generosity of God. Yes, we pray trustingly and we submit to his sovereignty, but we pray boldly and audaciously asking God to do amazing and incredible things. I remember um, when uh, our church was just beginning and uh, we were you know, just kind of right out of the gate. I actually didn't plant a church. I um, was revitalizing a church, uh, sort of a sleepy Baptist church that had been there for um, 40 years, and um, uh, we were, had about 300 people, and we had the audacious idea that we wanted to, um, we wanted to, to have a thousand people at Easter, and it sounded crazy to everybody. And I remember people saying, like, that's just not, like, that's never, we, how we even hold a thousand people? 
We prayed, we fasted, we planned, and I can still remember the, um, uh, one of the, the head ushers comes up to me at the end of, uh, of that Sunday, and uh, he was one of the guys that was the most critical of all this new kind of activity, and he had these big tears in his eyes, and he pulled out a card, and it said 1,122. That was the amount of people that God had brought on that. Now, um, I know that numbers aren't everything, but I also know that there was something in that for our church of, of, of we expected great things of God. We believed he wanted to reach our community. And then we attempted great things for God. And that was similar to several years, a um, few years after that, when we felt like God gave us the burden to plant a thousand churches. I can remember a mentor, a mentor of mine, a mature Christian leader saying, that's just like what church plants a thousand churches. And I just said, I really feel like our elders feel like God has put that in our heart. I'm happy to tell you that as of right now, when I'm recording this, we're at 482. Um, we, we said 1,000 churches in 40 years. We're on year 11, and we are at 482. And it looks like we're going to be able to complete that journey of planting 1,000 churches um, by year 20. Um, and that's actually probably a pretty conservative, uh, conservative um, estimation. The point is, um, yes, there are times we pray things, and God redirects us. There are times that we ask God for things we think are in his will, and he says, nope, I've got something different for you. Sometimes we pray bold prayers, and we struggle. Uh, sometimes um, God glorifies himself by faithfulness in the midst of what feels like a desert. But sometimes, sometimes, sometimes God takes that bold, audacious prayer and he uses it just to unleash his power. Let's not get to heaven and look over the course of our life and see all these things that Jesus would have done, but he just didn't do because of our unbelief. Yes, I am willing to labor in obscurity. I am willing to do the hard work. I'm willing to labor in what feels like a desert and... Um, Psalm 126, plant seeds one at a time and water them with my tears. But I'm also saying, Lord Jesus, today I want you to pour out your power and I want you to send an awakening and a revival in my community that is similar to what I, you've seen you do in history, what you did in, in, in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, what you did in Nineveh in the book of Jonah. I believe you can do it again and I'm asking you to do it. I want to pray a bold prayer and I want to give you a chance to work. Let's pray bold prayers together and let's see what God and only God can do.